that go, went from that actually the, the, the grant will address what are the changes that occur in the brain decades before the disease is overtly seen. Today, for example, we believe that Alzheimer's disease starts much early, decades earlier than we see it in patients. So this is exactly what the grant will address. And it's a very interesting group of people. In fact, it was only day before that we all met as a group. So people like me who work at the molecular level, to people like Arun and Sridhar who work with human subjects uh, using imaging and psychophysical tools to understand cognition. We all come together along with the clinicians and we are having an absolutely wonderful time. We'll put the first three to, the MRI at, the, at IAC, a three Tesla magnet is coming in very soon. And I, know, I think we now need for the image analysis people to join us. In fact, I just went out of this meeting for an hour and met with Professor Rajkopalan in electrical engineering to talk about how, what kind of image analysis he does and how we could use his help as we build our MR facility. So, but this is still a small effort. So what we need is probably larger teams of people come together. I think the boundaries between disciplines are disappearing and there's a real need for people to come together to solve the problems. I also want to briefly tell you about the Center for Brain Research that's being established at Indian Institute of Science through the gift of 225 crores from Mr. Gopal Krishnan, the same person who has funded CCBR. Uh, we also have three chairs in neuromorphic computing at Indian Institute of Science that is operated through the computer science department. Professor Narhari, who is the divisional chair, is here. Uh, he, so we collaborate very closely. And we are putting together the CCBR activities. It's interesting that there are three of us who actually are working. One is Professor Rangarajan from mathematics. Another is Professor Narahari from computer science. And the third is myself from Center for Neuroscience. This gives you a glimpse of how CCBR will develop, right? Because it brings, it's not all biologists who are going to build. One of the goals of CCBR is to work on the aging brain. And the idea is, to create a space in CCBR which will promote clinical research, an area that has been absent in the country, more because our public funded institutions, the clinicians are burdened with seeing patients and the service obligations. So we want to create a space. So the idea is to start a longitudinal study of aging where we look at human subjects over a 10 year period, looking at imaging, both PET and MRI, now, with PET imaging, we have tools that can tell us not only glucose utilization, but also the amyloid load, the tau load. So there are various ways we can combine the chem brain chemistry with the structure using PET and MRI, the genetics, the biochemistry, and we are trying to build the basic biology also behind it. And uh, we have two people from the US who have agreed to set up labs in CB CC CBR. Uh, Professor Rudolf Tanzi from Harvard and Sam Sisodia from University of Chicago. So the idea is that we combine all this data that comes and we will be interacting closely with computer science, ECE and the supercomputing center at IAC and electrical engineering to develop a Google-like platform to put all this data in the public domain for all of you engineers to come and take a look at it and see what you can do with it. Because the idea is how early can we diagnose a disease so that we can bring about alterations in the lifestyle which can slow down the progress of the disease? The second thing, of course, is can we identify risk and protective factors of the disease by studying the human subjects as they age and identify what promotes normal aging and what promotes pathological aging? So CCBR itself will be collaborating with other institutions in Bangalore, such as the NCBS, and of course, we'll be closely working with NIMHANS, which is the clinical center. So this is the type of collaborative efforts we are building. And I'm hoping that IIT Chennai and the CCBR will be close partners with us as we move along. So with this, I'll stop and um, I'll ask Arun to tell us about what he's doing. Thank you to the organizers and to Vijay to uh, give me a chance to present uh, uh, this. So uh, first, I'll tell you an overview of uh, our department. Uh, this is just uh, our department in numbers. Um, we've been very successful in attracting very good faculty. We've, uh, we have, uh, uh, we've, we've been also successful in attracting uh, funding, and uh, a lot of the faculty hold uh, uh, very competitive fellowships from uh, various international funding agencies and so on. 
But the most remarkable thing actually about our department is that we have, a, we have a colleagues who are really spanning studies of the brain at all levels. So uh, we, uh, the people who are studying the brain at the molecular and cellular uh, level and people who are studying, and the department is roughly split uh, half ways uh, into people who are studying cellular and molecular neuroscience and systems and cognitive neuroscience. So these are the faculty who are studying on the molecular side of uh, neuroscience. Um, this is, uh, so <clears throat> we have people who are studying um, uh, development of the nervous system. Uh, Deepak looks at uh, nanoscale organization of synapses using microscopy. Balaji looks at how memories are formed and again using uh, two photon imaging optogenetics. Uh, Naren is also a sort of complementary to what Shamla works on, is uh, studying how neurons develop and regenerate. Uh, on, uh, and Muji, of course, works on, has been working for a while on um, uh, why and how neurons degenerate in various neurodegenerative diseases. On the systems and cognitive side, um, I'm going to tell you a bit about my own research at the end, so I won't say much about that. Uh, we have Supratim who works on um, how brain rhythms uh, are generated and how they're modulated during attention. Uh, Sridhar works on how we pay attention and make decisions. He's going to say a few words about his own research in a bit. Uh, Adi works on how we control and, uh, and make movements. And uh, recently we have been joined by Sachin who uh, looks at uh, uh, how we navigate in the world um, uh, and uh, in, the, in the hippocampus how uh, representation of space and time work uh, together. So that's a very brief overview of our department. I'm going to switch now to uh, tell you a little bit about the kind of work that I do. Um, I've titled this actually uh, rather provocatively as if we can make computers say, uh, play chess, then why can't we make them see? And this is quite a profound and practical uh, and profound question because, uh, uh, for example, we very frequently see things like this on websites today. And these are proof that run-of-the-mill or state-of-the-art computer programs, or at least commercial <coughs> computer programs, uh, use these kinds of tests to make us recognize these distorted letters when you're filling out forms on websites. And they're, they're there precisely to authenticate you as a human being. So all you need to do is to not display empathy or compassion, but rather just show, do this. It's a very stupid task for human, human beings, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but a computer can't do this. And so um, even in the real world, there are no good commercially available applications for uh, image recognition, although there's a lot of advances in deep learning today, which I'll tell you, touch upon a little bit later. So for example, we took a, a good face detection algorithm this just to give you a sense of how good face detection is in the real world. So here's an image that you might encounter in, if you're touring India, especially in Varanasi or something like that. And this is the detections of a face detection algorithm run through this image. And you can see that, you know, it's catching, of course, a, very, a lot of very obvious images. It's not catching that guy who's turned away. And so on. there's a lot of errors it might make. You don't see a lot of errors that it's making in terms of uh, finding something that, is not, something that is not a face and calling it a face. But even those errors do exist, and those are errors that you would, that no human being would actually ever make. So the question then becomes, well, how does our brain recognize images? And so basically, this is the this is the uh, this is the core question that we are trying to address in our lab. We are using this. We are trying to address this question using a variety of experimental and computational techniques. So, for example, we test people who come into a lab to test their visual function, how they recognize objects. We make very fine grained record. Uh, test of object recognition. We're also getting into some imaging in humans. We're also doing some stimulation of uh, focal sites in the human brain to <coughs> perturb uh, object recognition and study the effects. And uh, uh, also, this is sort of where I've come from. I, I, I was trained as an engineer, but then I went on to do more of computational neuroscience, and I got interested in how the visual system works. I uh, learned how to record from the visual system while animals are looking at images and uh, study neural representation. So I'll show you some of that. And then finally, what unites a lot of these together is our ability to uh, test and validate models of object recognition using all these kinds of data. And so I'll show you also some of that. So let's, I, I understand that a lot of the discussions in the workshop have been about deep learning. So, and we've got interested in deep learning as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we've tried to do. So why are humans still better than machines? So if you look at the performance of deep learning networks, uh, the top one, so the best guess of a deep learning algorithm is 75% correct on object recognition. Now 75% correct is uh, not, I mean it's much better than what used to be, 
but it's still not as good as what a human might do. And human performance is often just taken to be, taken as granted to be just 100%. Uh, but how do we actually compare human and machine vision? The problem though is that if you want to compare human and machine vision in terms of percentage correct, the problem is that uh, you might be going through some kind of complex classifier. So you have some sort of feature space and you're making some arbitrary boundary which might be complicated or simple and then you're comparing the performance of the human uh, vision versus say computer vision. So is there a more basic way to study or make a, make a comparison between humans and machines? And the answer is compare distances rather than classification. So you take the classification out of the way and you simply ask how similar do, do people consider two objects? And how similar does a deep learning network considers two objects? And now you can compare distances in the deep learning network and distances in, um, in human vision. And that's what we set out to do. But then how do you measure distances in human vision? That's a very basic problem. We use a principle called visual search. So here's an example. So the time you take to find the odd one out here is a measure of how similar the target is or the odd one out is compared to the surroundings. It's a principle that's even used in nature. And so we simply take the time that people take to detect this odd one out as a measure of similarity. Okay, so now you can reconstruct, you can start measuring all kinds of distances between objects. And you can reconstruct a space which is essentially the perceptual space or the space in which objects are in our, in our head. Uh, and this is, for example, a snapshot which is constructed using multidimensional scaling. It tells you, for example, that two views of objects are close together, which means that our vision is view invariant. And then you can start making very fine-grained comparisons between distances in our perception versus distances in machine, in machine algorithms. And so, for example, here's one, uh, here's a very basic question you can ask. Do machine algorithms actually predict perceptual distances? And how will they do it? And of course, we can start now comparing any computer vision algorithm, not just deep learning, but you can combine all the available computer vision algorithms out there. And so here's our best model using a combination of a lot of different computer vision algorithms. And here are the perceived distances, which are in units of one over second, but this is basically because it's distances and not similarity. And now we focus on the deviations. That is, the model, of course, is doing pretty well. The correlation is 0.7. You could sort of go home if you're an optimist, but we are sort of not optimists. And we know there's a gap, a performance gap between computers and humans today. And so now you can say, what are the places where machines are making mistakes? And so what are the kinds of images where machines are not predicting as well as humans? Or what are the places where machines are underestimating or overestimating these distances? So here, for example, is um, all the pairs where machines are actually underestimating the distance between objects. So for example, symmetric objects are a lot more distinct in our perception than machine algorithms are uh, able to predict. There are other, other, other things that I won't really talk about. There's another interesting category here where machines actually consider these objects to be very dissimilar, but our perception actually calls them very similar. So for example, these are objects at different multiple views. They're also objects that share lots of features and parts. So for example, two objects that share the same shape or same, same texture often tend to be more similar in our perception than, in, than, in, uh, than called by machines. So we can start now making very fine-grained comparisons. But let me now focus and switch tracks a little bit and show you an example of some experimental data we collect from the brain. Uh, which has to do with this particular thing which machines are very bad at. That is, they're not able to recognize objects across viewpoints, okay? So here, uh, just to give you a sense of this problem, um, how do you recognize these two as the same image? And the problem is that it's not trivial because a lot of features come into view, go out of view, things get occluded in different orders and so on. And so your ability to recognize these two objects as the same depends upon some complex kind of uh, computations that you bring. And this is not trivial because if you take a simple 2D transformation, you'll never get this 3D image. Okay, the 3D rotation is fundamentally different from the 2D, any 2D stretching or compression you can do. So then, I'll just show you a, a snapshot of uh, brain recording now. We're recording from the monkey brain. This is the front of the head, the eyes are out here. This is the back of the head and information from the eyes goes to the back of the head first. And what's highlighted here in brown is actually the form recognition pathway or the object recognition pathway. I'm going to show you a recording from this area, which is the final purely visual area in the brain. And what we do is to insert an electrode into the brain. We record very tiny uh, action potentials. We, we pick them up uh, by putting the electrode close enough to the neuron. And then what I'm going to show you now is a recording, a reconstruction of a recording where 
you're going to see what the animal saw. This is a live animal sitting in front of a computer screen. He's not doing a task. He's just looking at images. And for successfully just looking at these images, he gets a juice reward. So uh, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to look at these images. And what you're going to hear over the audio of my laptop is the converted activity of, an, of a single neuron in the visual cortex uh, converted, to, in, converted into an audio signal. Okay? Uh, but you won't get juice for doing the task. I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> so here's the, here's the recording. as tr 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 things like that are the burst of activity of uh, the neuron in response to these images and what you probably heard as uh, uh, you know in uh, is that uh, the neuron is responding similarly to the two views of an object and you saw it uh, responding similarly to two views of the cow two views of the of the leopard and so on and so forth okay um, highlighting the fact that these neurons are actually view invariant that is they respond the same way to a particular object regardless of the view and I'll leave you with that, and I'll uh, turn it over to Sridhar to give us a, a snapshot of his research. I'm uh, Sridhar Devarajan. I'm a uh, newest recruit to the Center for Neuroscience. I thank the organizers and the chairperson for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'd like to give you a very high-level overview of how we're using uh, model-based approaches to understanding brain function, and specifically the cognitive process of attention. Um, I thought before I begin, I'd give you a slight overview of how I got here. So I started, uh, I did my B.Tech and uh, dual degree, uh, B.Tech, M.Tech at IIT Madras here with uh, Professor Srinivas Chakravarti. And then I moved to Stanford to neuroscience for my PhD. I then moved a couple of buildings over to the School of Medicine for my postdoc. Um, and then I came back to the Indian Institute of Science for my um, for faculty position now. And it looks like I'm now back to IIT Madras, so that completes the loop. <laughs> so, um, what is uh, selective attention? So, selective attention, as many of you know, is the process of selecting the most relevant information for uh, differential processing and decision making, right? So, uh, we all had a great example of selective attention in this room. There's this noise that's been going on all through yesterday and today, and yet you're able to focus your attention on my voice and, you know, sort of amplify my voice and uh, pay attention to it so that you can, you know, uh, understand what I'm saying, ignoring the uh, concurrent noise going on in the background. Deficits of attention can have debilitating consequences. For example, the patient here uh, with spatial neglect, damage to a particular part of the brain called the parietal cortex. When you ha ask this patient to copy this diagram over, the patient completely ignores one half of this drawing, uh, which suggests that the patient has a strong attentional neglect to this half of visual space. Um, the long-term goal of our research is to understand and identify the neural mechanisms of selective attention in health and in disease. Uh, but because of my engineering background, uh, I, we, I'll be primarily uh, using model-based approaches for analyzing behavioral and brain imaging data, and I'll highlight these really quickly as we go along. Uh, to give you a slightly uh, bigger picture into this, there's many brain regions that's involved in attention, and those of you who are uh, familiar with neuroscience will know that this prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex are two of the key areas implicated in attention control in humans. There are also evolutionarily older subcortical structures like the thalamus and the midbrain, including the colliculus. Now, uh, very little is known about exactly how these regions contribute to brain function. Uh, when we record electrical activity from the brain, we also find that when subjects pay attention, electrical activity organizes into oscillatory patterns, rhythmic patterns. And uh, it's, it's quite a puzzle as to how these different brain areas and brain oscillations contribute to attention. We are particularly interested in understanding uh, two particular phenomena in attention, sensitivity and bias. Uh, I don't want to belabor this too much because a very brief presentation, but the simple idea is that when you pay attention to something, sensitivity control mechanisms alter your sensory percept of the object so that you can actually see the object more clearly, 
bias control mechanisms, on the other hand, operate on downstream decision-making processes so that you tend to only decide based on information coming from this object and basically ignore information coming in from elsewhere. And the goal is to really separate these two things and to understand how these various brain regions and brain rhythms play into sensitivity and bias control. Um, that's our objective. So for this, we are following a series of experiments that includes model-based behavioral analysis and model-based functional MRI and diffusion MRI. Uh, we've developed a multidimensional signal detection model, uh, which is a model for analysis of behavior. Uh, I'd be happy again to explain this to somebody uh, in more detail if they're uh, interested in learning more about signal detection uh, theory or analysis of behavior. With this model, we've been able to show that cortical uh, uh, regions, including the prefrontal and parietal cortex, are primarily involved in sensitivity control, whereas subcortical regions are primarily involved in bias control. Uh, we sort of put this out as a very uh, a provocative hypothesis. Let's see if it holds up over time. Um, and now in the, at the Center for Neuroscience, uh, we've started developing model-based approaches for the analysis of brain imaging data. Uh, this is a um, treating the whole brain as a one-dimensional uh, you know, linear dynamical system. And uh, we are actually able to see certain remarkable features in the functional connectivity matrices in the brain. So for example, we're able to see, so when I, what I'm showing here is the connectivity matrix, the functional connectivity matrix in the left hemisphere of the brain and the right hemisphere of the brain. And despite our knowledge that these two hemispheres are highly specialized, you can see a very remarkable pattern of similarity between these two hemispheres. It's actually quite surprising to us. Um, similarly, we've been able to identify particular hub nodes in the brain that receive connections from various other uh, regions in the brain. These include the parietal cortex, the one that I mentioned was involved in attention, as well as the caudate nucleus, which is a uh, nucleus in the basal ganglia. Uh, also, uh, we've been doing diffusion imaging, which is uh, tracing tracks between different brain regions. And we have some preliminary results. Uh, this is uh, work by Varsha Srinivasan, who's also here. He's a, she's a PhD student. We have preliminary results that connectivity between the left and the, uh, left prefrontal and parietal cortex actually is much stronger than the connectivity between the right prefrontal and parietal cortex. We've seen this now in 10 subjects, and it's quite puzzling to us, and we're doing more analysis to confirm these trends. Uh, just to quickly wrap up, we we're also exploring uh, various multimodal imaging techniques, including concurrent EEG fMRI, as well as concurrent TMS fMRI. TMS, as Arun mentioned, is a way to stimulate the brain, but very little is known about how this stimulation actually affects brain function. So we are trying to also develop concurrent TMS fMRI. And as you can all imagine, these uh, techniques are cutting edge and have uh, you know, pose severe technological challenges, and I'm very happy to collaborate with people who have expertise uh, and our interest in uh, developing, co-developing some of these techniques. Uh, all of the questions that we've been addressing have wide clinical relevance uh, in terms of various uh, treating and managing various disorders of attention control, including ADD, autism, Alzheimer's disease, and so forth. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my, uh, the funding agencies and my collaborators.